This is episode number 40, featuring artist Carl Dempwolf. Welcome to the Plen Air Podcast from Plen Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. In the Plen Air Podcast, we dive into the world of outdoor painting called Plen Air Painting. For those of you who don't know, it's a term meaning outdoors. The French pronounce it Plen Air, others say Plain Air, but no matter how you pronounce it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who love going outdoors to paint. And this show is all about that movement. This week's podcast is brought to you by the Plen Air Convention coming up in April in San Diego. It is the largest gathering of Plen Air artists in history, from people who are new at it to people who are experienced pros. Everybody gets together, shares information, on stage demonstrations, and then painting outdoors around beautiful San Diego the whole time. You can learn more at Plen Air Convention. Dot com. It's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting, and you can help by sharing this podcast with your friends. You can also email me, Eric, at plenairmagazine.com. Well, this interview is brought to you by the Plen Air Salon Art Competition, which is ending any minute. You've got to get your last uh, best paintings entered. Uh, you still have a chance at winning the annual grand prize, or the bi-monthly prizes, national exposure, getting your um, painting on the cover of Plein Air magazine in front of all those people at Barnes & Noble stores and around the world. Learn more at Plein Air Salon. It's a big prize. You don't want to miss that. Well, let's get right to our interview with Carl Dempwolf. Hello, Carl. Hey, Eric. Good morning. Well, we're really excited. Uh, you will be receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Plein Air Convention. And uh, so I'm really excited about that to honor you and, and all you've done for the art community. But also, I'm excited about this podcast. I think this is going to be one of those really insightful times where there's so much to learn from you. And I'm, I'm really anxious to do that. Okay. <laughs> so... Why don't we start from the very beginning? Uh, how did this whole art thing happen for you? Was there a particular influence in your life? Well, you know, uh, photography is really what my early influences were. Really? The, really? the art, yeah, photography was something that I was very, very interested in, and I was hoping to make a living at it. But I started off with uh, uh, an education, teaching the educationally handicapped, but art was always kind of uh, hovering in the background. My my mother would ask me often how she'd love to have me paint something, uh, and uh, and so as a as a favor to her, and because I was interested in it and because I enjoyed it, I would paint something for her uh, on special occasions. So art has kind of been really painting for a living or doing it as a career was not something that was foremost in my mind. So uh, when, when your mother started saying to you, would you paint something for me, was it, uh, did you have any, any education at that time or you just, you know, no, were, no, just... no, 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 no background in, in art at all. And not really just doing my own thing, enjoying it and uh, kind of doodling. And so there was no real uh, instruction going on. She just kind of enjoyed me uh, uh, putting some paint down on a, on a board or a canvas and, uh, and uh, that was the end of it, you know. Uh, I mean, it seemed, though, that I remember all the way back to my childhood that I was doing a lot of drawing and sketching and doodling and uh, making uh, coping saw cutouts of things that uh, seemed to please me and uh, please my parents or my mom anyway. And, uh, and so, no, there was no real formal education, no real formal instruction by anyone. It was just something I enjoyed doing. So what happened? Tell me, uh, you, you went through uh, high school. Did you go to college? Did you do art in either of those places? Yeah. Uh, high school was, no, there was no real art going on. Uh, 
we came to this country in 1954 and it was junior high and so high school I was still learning the ropes and stuff uh, but uh, by the time I got to college and stuff I started taking some art classes and uh, and and uh, my future wife Diane she uh, was taking a class from Hans Burkhardt who was the uh, the resident artist at the Cal State Northridge here in the San Fernando Valley and I liked uh, her class so much better than mine and so I kind of went and sat in her class instead of my own. And so uh, he's the only in, he's the only person of an artist background who's pretty well known today that uh, where I enjoyed sitting in class. And so art became a little bit more important during my college years. But again, it was not uh, a career that I was looking for. And uh, and so uh, it really was it was not on the horizon as something that I really wanted to do. Well, I want to back up because you said something. Uh, you said you came to this country in 1954, which was the year I was born. So it was a good year to celebrate. Uh, yeah. What uh, you you were from Germany? Is that right? Yeah, I was born in Germany. And in what 19- age were you when you came over in '54? I was 14. I was age 14 when we came. My sister and brother were a couple of years younger. My father was an engineer. They needed engineers after the war, and so that was the reason for coming. And what a great move that was! I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, uh, I keep thinking back, and just yesterday. February 16th, we celebrated our 64th year in this country. Wow. I mean, uh, it's been a wonderful time. So uh, where in Germany were you living? Well, during the war, we lived down in the south in, in the Bavarian area uh, in Laupheim, which is a very, very small area, kind of a rural agricultural place. So the war really didn't uh, uh, come to us Uh it, it really didn't. I mean, it was just kind of a very um, wonderful area with nice mountains and hills and farm folks and stuff. But that's where we lived during the war. And uh, afterwards, we ended up moving back to the north where I was born. Which was where? Dusseldorf or someplace? No, it was uh, near Bremen, Delmenhorst, Bremen. near Bremen, up oh. in the, in, in, uh, in uh, just uh, about maybe 100 miles south of the Danish border. So I'm just curious about that because you said you didn't experience much of the war. Um, there was no no fighting going on in that part of the South. Is that right? No, there was no there was no fight. In fact, you know, whenever I think back to the war and stuff, I do remember seeing uh, hundreds and hundreds of bombers flying overhead, probably heading toward the oil field and in, in Romania. But uh, and then at the very end of the war, it was more of an adventure. I mean, American tanks would be coming through town and they would throw us uh, little chocolates and gum. I mean, uh, this was exciting, you know. I mean, so th- there was no real, there was no fighting going on. No bombs were dropped in the area. There was no really any military value where we were living. And uh, it uh, uh, it was just kind of a wonderful place to grow up, really. And if you had to be in a war... This was a great place, and uh, having the Americans come through in their tanks and throwing us chocolates, I mean, this seems like something out of some story instead of reality, you know? Well, I, you know, the, you've taught me something today, because I would have assumed that anybody living in Germany uh, during the war would have, have seen, um, you know, bombings and, and uh, seen the, the uh, spoils of war, if you will. So you're very, you were very fortunate. Yeah. Wow. So you came here in 54 uh, as a 14-year-old, and mm-hmm. that's when you went into the American school system. Did you not speak any English at the time? Well, you know, uh, uh, we spent, my father came out to California to get to start working. Lockheed was his new employer, and he was an aeronautical engineer, and uh, so they needed engineers like that. Myself and uh, my uh, mother and brother and sister we stayed with a uh, my mother, sister, and aunt in Irvington, New Jersey, for the first uh, three months. We came on February 16th. Uh, I mean, three days later, we were enrolled in the local school. Uh, the local, uh, I don't know if it must have been a middle school. Yeah, it was a middle school. And uh, we would spend half the day uh, in second grade. I was 14, and uh, in, in the little tiny chairs reading Dick and Jane books. 
And uh, at the the other half of the day, we would spend in our regular seventh or eighth grade class that we were supposed to be in. And uh, it was tough for a while, but I tell you, because you're so immersed, there's just uh, no way for you not to learn the language. And by the time we came to California, I remember writing a letter to my dad in California uh, saying that I now spoke perfect English. This is June uh, in 1954, and we came in February. So three months later, I thought I was a pretty good English speaker. And <laughs> And uh, and it all happened very quickly, and uh, it seems like my brother and sister seem to have similar experiences. So that says something about total immersion. You learn the language quickly. You know, nobody's speaking German to me. They're all speaking English, and I was forced to learn the language, and it goes very quickly. Yeah, well, I, I would imagine that that, uh, that immersion thing is, is huge, and the, the pliable young brain, that's a wonderful oh, opportunity. Exactly. So, so did you experience any... Um, uh, any bigotry or anything of that nature, because there was probably a lot of hatred for the Germans in, in America during that period of time. No, there was no, uh, there was no hatred. There was no animosity. There was no. Uh, I mean, I felt like I was accepted. I felt ill at ease because of my language difficulties. I knew I wasn't uh, a perfect English speaker, uh, and and to overcome that. Uh, immediately in high school, I uh, joined Coach Mercer on the junior varsity basketball team. I loved sports and stuff. So that's one of the ways I cope with whatever uh, feelings of being uncomfortable I had. But uh, no problem. Uh, I was asked to give uh, a, um, a, uh, a book report. And I remember this was, and you know, for I, it's so typical. I would... Uh, I would kind of use my uh, background, not being a good, good English speaker to get out of things, you know, and that lasted for a little while, but not very long. And eventually, uh, you know, that excuse no longer uh, was valid. And so I had to give a book report. And one of the things that I remember, this is so clear in my head, I gave a book, book report on something that I had never heard of before. It was the the concentration camps, and it was very uncomfortable for me. And I remember confronting my parents about it, and uh, and uh, and my parents, and knowing that the media was controlled by the by the Nazi party and stuff, I can eventually came to accept the fact that they just didn't know what was going on either. And uh, but for me to be able to give that book report was a very humbling experience and something that I hadn't been aware of. And for a while, I was kind of upset with my parents because I thought, how could they not have known? But uh, knowing that uh, when the uh, media is controlled by uh, by a group of people that want to only let certain things out, this was not one of the things that people hmm. generally knew about unless they weren't actually involved. And so I was angry for a long time. But eventually, I accepted the fact that they really had no way of knowing. Well, and and uh, you, you're so fortunate to have been protected. I would imagine the anxiety um, as a young child, knowing things that were going on, would have been pretty tough to deal with. Would well, let's let's move tough. forward. Um, so yes. I, I'm curious. Then you you went through school. Did you go into college? Yep, I graduated. Uh, at uh, Cal State Northridge, and then uh, I started. And you know, art wasn't on my mind. I needed a career. I needed to support uh, a, a probably a, a coming family and stuff. And so, and my wife and I both decided to that we wanted to go into education because we thought we both would like to go traveling. Uh, travel was going to be something that we both wanted, and we wanted to go, you know, see the world, go back to Europe. So the idea was summers off. And with summers off, exactly. That yeah. was the plan, you know. Yeah. And uh, and so we both went into education and uh, ended up getting my master's from SC. And uh, uh, and so that was the plan, but it really never worked out because uh, I really started getting uh, 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 really fascinated and interested in, in filmmaking and, and, uh, and photography and filmmaking. And so I... Uh, Right from the very first summer on, uh, a friend of mine who was teaching also the same thing, educationally handicapped kids, we wanted to make films, educational films. We are in this business, 
and we love film and photography and we had been playing with film and photography for some time. So this is what we were going to do. We we're going to make educational films. And starting from the very first summer, uh, we uh, got busy uh, writing scripts and thinking of ideas of what we thought we would need in the classroom. And uh, so uh, traveling really didn't happen until years later. <laughs> and, and did you end up going into the film industry? Uh, it was uh, we made educational films for years, and uh, and what turned us around, and we said this is not going to be our livelihood. And of course, we kept on teaching. This was only a summer occupation. Is that uh, the distributor of our films ended up making. 85 percent and the two of us had to share 15 percent and on that we weren't able to make a living and what kind so, of educational films were they there were films for the grades that we were in we were teaching seventh grade or sixth grade educationally handicapped children and so we thought films on safety and uh, films first before we started making educational films we had to have a calling card to the industry so that once we did make educational films, we could show them what we were capable of. So our first film was called, the, and was a film about an Italian immigrant called The Story of a Craftsman, about an Italian immigrant who came to America uh, as an orphan. And he came here uh, just about uh, during, just prior to World War II to make, uh, uh, and what were his skills? What he had learned was using a lathe and using uh, skills in a machine shop and stuff. And eventually he started making the Calicchio trumpet and a trumpet that uh, became world famous. And Marsalis and other trumpet players would come into a shop when we made the film in the 70s uh, to have a new mouthpiece made. And uh, this uh, little Italian immigrant was uh, was not a trumpet player. And uh, but he knew how to make the trumpet and make the valves and make mouthpieces. And he would do that for the industry and to make his living. He would uh, put a bunch of trumpets together and uh, and head off in his car to Las Vegas and and go see the bands and uh, <laughs> sell his trumpet. I mean, that's, <laughs> well, that's a fascinating great. story. So uh, now we're, we're teaching, we're doing yes. films. Uh, what happens next? How do we get into the... the um, the art thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were making films for years, but then I knew this wasn't going to be um, uh, something that I, I really wanted to do. So, or I was tired of it after 10 years and I decided to look for a job in the film industry. So I got a, a job at Hughes Aircraft and the photo department was there for a month and then ended up working for a company close to home here in the San Fernando Valley called Marquardt. I became their photographer and filmmaker, and that was my career. During that time of being a filmmaker, uh, and I loved my job, I really did, uh, but I, I started uh, painting on weekends on my own uh, right here at home. I started painting. I didn't have any real contacts. I didn't know Peter Adams and the California Art Club. I just for some reason thought uh, this is something I would like to do. And, and you did this and, while you were working as a filmmaker. Yes. As as a filmmaker photographer for this aerospace company in uh -huh. Van Nuys, I started uh, working on my own. And there was no, you know, I'm looking at this as my future career. I didn't look at this. Uh, um, I didn't look at this as something. I just wanted to do it because I enjoyed it. And I, apparently all the, the painting I had done uh, for my parents, for my mom especially, was coming back to me. I've always enjoyed it. And so while being a photographer, filmmaker for the aerospace company, I ended up a painting on my own in the garage, you know? And uh, I started uh, looking around to see what other people were doing. And eventually I ended up running into the California Art Club and Peter Adams, who had just revived uh, the uh, California Art Club, the organization. What year was that? Uh, what year was that? Uh, in the in the eighties, yeah. early eighties. Early eighties. Okay. And so you were starting to see some uh, some influential painters. We're starting to see some good work. I started to uh, I started to uh, not look at living artists, but I looked at artists who had uh, who had been 
an influence in a movement. Uh, you know, at first it was Van Gogh and Monet and Pizarro and Sicily and all those guys, but eventually it became to America. And I started looking at at art and art books, and boy, I tell you, that's been a, something that's been going on at the same time my painting has been going on is, is collecting art books and looking at art books and reading about artists and stuff. And so uh, artists like Child Hassam and uh, Tuckman uh, had become, and William Wendt, California guys who came to California eventually, Franz Bischoff, they became really the staple of the people that I looked at and the people who I, whose paintings I studied. The biographies of paintings, of painters, of uh, the Impressionists that ended up coming from Europe, like William Wendt, uh, and who really wasn't an Impressionist when he came. He went to the Chicago Art Institute and started, uh, you know, painting there in the evenings, taking classes. And then he ended up being in an assembly line where he uh, would paint uh, the windows or the tree or something in some kind of an assembly line. Really? I didn't but the know art. That. I'm sorry? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I mean, I love the, uh, I love, uh, you know, impressions like that of people whose work I loved and who became, uh, William Went, of course, being later on uh, the dean of the California Plain Air Artists and stuff here in California. Uh, but uh, uh, Tachman and, and, and Hassam and stuff, I mean, I've, I've got their books and I'm looking at the flag paintings of, uh, of Hassam. It's wonderful. I mean, I, this, is, this, is, this was my real, my baptism into, into the art world. It really was. Uh, and these, these were my heroes, these guys who are no longer around and whose paintings I would see on a trip uh, uh, to Ogunquit back in uh, back in or in line, I mean, f running into museums and looking at their work. This was this was fascinating. So you were looking at the the masters. Was there a point at which that you used that to drive your own work, or did you try to find someone to teach you and take you to another level? Yeah, yeah be, at this time, you know, uh, in 1980. Uh, in 19, let's see, I was laid off in 1995 from the aerospace industry. And, and during that time, I was looking at, uh, at work in museums. I was painting in my garage. And eventually, I started uh, meeting uh, the California Art Club members, including Peter and Elaine Adams. But I really didn't find someone to study under. Really, the, the, the ceased artists, the impressionists that were in America, really were the source of inspiration and the source of where I'd, and I still go back to them today, you know? I still go back to them and I and, and then my students, I tell them, you know, pick an artist you really like because that was my background. I I, I loved Went and uh, and uh, Hanson Putoff and Jack Wilkinson Smith and the people who I looked up to and whose books I had. And uh, and I keep telling them, pick an artist that you like. If you find someone to paint with that you really like, uh, great. And if you don't, pick an artist that's no longer living or is living and there's a book available on them and, uh, and copy their work. I mean, how many times did I cop copy these artists and then, you know, make a little eight by ten of it and made it a present to my sister and my brother and... And uh, just made them. This was my this was my internship, you know, and making copies of artists who I liked. Well, I think that's something that's often overlooked. You know, we have um, we have so much more today than you had at that time. There's there's a lot lot more workshops. There are videos. Yes. Uh, there's events, uh, but there was probably little or none of that at the time. You were you were trying to figure this all out and. Copying a masterwork is, um, as long as you don't try to pass it off as your own, is really no, is really a beautiful thing because you. I, I noticed when I first started doing that, which was probably twenty years ago, um, you, you know, in a figure you could make one tiny little change in a brush stroke and it would make the figure look thin versus looking heavy, or yes. uh, you know, one little tiny little thing in a tree. So you don't really realize those those things that the artists have figured out until you actually try to get it as close to, uh, to the exact thing as possible. 
Yeah, that is a very European tradition, too. Uh, I mean, how often have you gone into a museum here? Uh, not uh, 20 years ago, where people would actually get permission from the museum to copy the work. But in Europe, that's an old time tradition. And so I guess I kind of fell into it. I fell into copying work that I enjoyed, not in a museum, but from photographs or from posters or from books that I had gotten. And so that really was something that the Europeans have done for a long, long time. And I encourage my students to do the same. So were you forced into becoming a full-time artist or you lost your job? Right. Uh, was that the point at which you said, okay, I'm going to jump in? Or were you looking for other jobs? Did you end up working in other, uh, something else? Yeah, I was trying to find a job. Uh, I was trying to find a job after I was laid off. I went into some headhunting business. Um, I, I, and so I tried that for a while, but golly, the pressure the pressure was so great. I was down on Wilshire Boulevard in, in uh, Los Angeles, and at noontime, I went to the synagogue across the street just to sit and relax for a few minutes. It was so, the pressure was so great. It was so intense uh, that, I mean, I ended up developing a psychosomatic cough where every time I'd pick up the phone to talk to somebody to bring them back into the office, <laughs> whether I had a career for him or not, I'd start coughing uncontrollably. And so that now was we know moment. anytime we, any of us who talk to you, if you start coughing, we know you don't really <laughs> want to talk to us. <coughs> well, Eric. <coughs> <coughs> it, was, it was awful. And getting a job as a photographer at age 60 and stuff wasn't going to happen either or 58 or whatever I was. And uh, um, no, it wasn't going to happen. So I decided I'm going to paint. And of course, I was I was a photographer and I was doing uh, I was doing jobs in photography for people. I was somebody with something. Somebody wanted a wedding photograph or somebody wanted a, 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 a wedding film videotaped. I did that. And uh, uh, in other words, I, was a, I had skills as a photographer that I could sell. And I was doing that for a while. But I knew I wasn't going to go into a company with benefits as a photographer. So and, how did you transition? How, how did you actually get to the point where you went from making paintings to selling paintings? Well, and that's really where the California Art Club came in. You know, Peter asked me to join. I did him almost immediately. Uh, I started participating in, in group shows that they had. Uh, and that's really was the beginning of my art uh, career as a living, uh, making a living, uh, joining the groups, uh, uh, sitting in discussions, going, deciding on painting. Uh, I remember the Oak Group paints up there near the Santa Barbara area and the California Art Club was anxious to get out and get known uh, to participate in saving areas. Uh, this is real close to the Carpinteria area where oil companies have uh, access to the coastline. We would paint up there sell the artwork, uh, promote the Oak Group in Santa Barbara to raise funds uh, to save this area, not uh, for future development, but for uh, for um, an area, which uh, a coastal area, which is just gorgeous. And so I got heavily involved with Peter and Elaine uh, painting in areas, uh, raising awareness that this needs to be an area that needs to be uh, uh, protected, and uh, we were doing it by raising funds, painting, and selling our art. So is and, that when the plein air thing started happening for you? Because yeah, you were painting right. in your garage originally. That's exactly right. That's exactly when it happened. You know, until then, I really wasn't painting outside. And how did that change your work? Well, you know, for a long time, I was trying to paint uh, the size of the paintings that I would try to put into exhibits and shows, and uh, and do it, and I don't know if I'm a natural, slow, pa naturally slow painter, but I would rarely be able to finish a 16 by 20 being out there hours and hours. It didn't look like my work. And the work, of course, I was used to was the work that I looked at once I'd spent time in the garage for a week. 
And so that was a really tough transition. And, uh, and I decided because the next day, do I drive back up the Carpinteria for an hour and spend a day and continue to paint up there? It went very quickly that I realized that I needed to reduce the size so that I would be able to finish something on location that I would be relatively happy with, that would look like my work. And so uh, I reduced the size. I went to 8 by 10 and eventually even smaller because uh, because uh, I, the minute you go to 8 by 10, you've got more choices to make. When you go to 16 by 20, you've got even more choices to make. You've got a bigger canvas to fill. And so the smaller I went, the, the smaller I went, the more, the easier it became to decide on four or five masses that I wanted to include in the painting and that uh, putting them on an eight by 10, six by eight or five by seven board was plenty. And for me to end up feeling like, like my work, this looks like a finished painting or this looks like how a finished, a larger finished painting of mine would look like if it were a normal size, a 16 by 20 or 14 by 18. So that's how that actually came about that I decided. And over the years, I've told my students to reduce the size too, because the larger you go, the more influenced I am by the uh, the the vista around me. And 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 being influenced by the vista was one of the things I didn't want to. I wanted to be influenced by what I felt that was in front of me, not by the actual tree or the rock or or the hill and stuff. For me, it was more important not to make a fact simile, but for me to be able to interpret what was there and get the feeling for the, what I felt when I was out in nature. And that really is the tough part. Well, that's uh, the tough part for all of us. And I'd like to probe that just a little bit because I think yeah. it's so important is that, uh, you know, we go to, we, we're, we're driving around, we're looking for a spot, we find a spot and that spot speaks to us. Right. And then we do a painting and the painting doesn't speak in the same way. How do you capture that sense of feeling? How do you capture the yeah. the soul of the place that you're painting? Is, yeah. is there something that you've found that is especially helpful? You know, uh, Eric, I, I think <laughs> uh, that, that is the toughest part. And But for me, I've decided over the years that being in this in this uh, in this creation, in this wonderful vista, or uh, wherever I happen to be sitting, this is the moment, the feeling that I have, and whatever I'm putting down on my little board or canvas is really secondary. It really is the feeling that I have, and it's you know going out to the Tejon with the California Art Club, and everybody is scattered all over the place, and I'm sitting right here, and I'm looking at the vista. Uh, and I'm saying, uh, this this is the most wonderful feeling that I've got. It's a feeling. That's really what it is. And now for me, I go through the process of putting my board up, making my little pencil sketch or my little sketchbook, and then transferring it onto my board, and then putting the paints out and starting to paint. I'm now in heaven. What I come up with uh, is almost irrelevant, you know? I mean, it's, it was the process of putting it down on the board that was important. Now, uh, and whether I've come up with something just spectacular or whether it's awful is really irrelevant to me. It was the process and the feeling of being there and going through the process of putting paint on board. That's important. Do you... And then when I... And then when I get home, and then when I get home and look at the board and I'm saying, oh my, I'm glad nobody saw this. Oh, I'm <laughs> glad this really didn't work out. But the feeling of how I felt and the emotional uh, oneness with, with the great spirit and stuff was what was important. Isn't that strange? I mean, I, I, and I don't usually say that to my fellow artists, but just last week, uh, a week ago, uh, was it a week? No, it was actually two weeks ago. Uh, uh, Chuck Kovacic and, and James uh, Wajovic, we went out to the Red Rock Canyon area out in the Mojave Desert. And we sat down and and I, and I we all painted our vistas. There were only three of us and it was beautiful. 
and and we were ready to pack up and James uh, James said you know I just I don't feel good about what I've done here and, I, and we kind of shared a a private moment where I said you know I rarely uh, come home with something that I really think is a great piece and stuff and he said just just sitting out here and and going through the process is what really was important to me and being with you guys and sharing a little moment uh, is what was really important. Uh, to fix this uh, or to make something of this in the studio, yeah, that'll be fine. It'll be work. It won't. Uh, it won't be. Uh, it, it'll be a job now to fix this and make it into something that I'll be uh, happy with or that I'll be able to make an enlargement of. And and sometimes that doesn't happen either. I mean, sometimes uh, I'm not excited enough to make this into an enlargement. So that's the case most of the time. Interesting. Well, yeah. so maybe we should transition to a couple of things because uh, we're going to run out of time before we know it. And yeah. and I'd like to talk about painting a little bit more. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of people who are discovering plein air painting for the first time because of this podcast being on iTunes. And um, we're, we're up to, I don't know, 40, 50,000 people listening. Okay. And um, so that's uh, that's a wonderful thing for plein air painting. But there are a lot of people who are in both places, right? You've got people who've never painted, you have people mm -hmm. who are starting to paint, you have people who are relatively experienced or even pros. What are some of the core essentials that you try to get your students to understand? And can you share some of those with us here? Yeah. Well, of course, what I want my students to understand is what is important to me. And that is that whenever I get too close to reality, that uh, I seem to kick my heels out and I want to uh, I want to stop because it is so important for me to not have a a, a, a facsimile, a, a a copy of what's in front of me. So whenever, whenever I get clo too close to reality in what I'm painting, and of course with a little five by seven or eight by ten, how close to reality can you get? Another reason for painting small. And so, um, uh, but I fight that even when I bring these little small studies into the studio and I make enlargements, I have to fight myself, me. I have to uh, fight being too real. Uh, I think too real, it's like when I make a frame and it's too perfect. It's like a machine made it. I can't have it. For me, I need to be loose and free and uh, away from reality. Yeah, you can tell it's a scene and there's a barn and, and yeah, there's some trees and they're probably eucalyptus, maybe not. But for me, uh, I try to have students uh, concentrate on five or six of the masses that are in front of them, a middle ground, a, a middle foreground, a background, a sky or something, and maybe something to emphasize there's a barn or a tree or a meadow something but painting small makes it so much easier to explain when people end up painting 16 by 20s or 18 24s they want to include it all and here in the small on a small board it's almost impossible and you're forced to reduce to the major masses that are in your view and uh you may want to pull a mass from the right or left that's not included and right in front of you. And that's uh, one of the things that I try to teach the students that are out there. Well, that's I think that's an important point because a lot of people um, think you have to be a purist and paint what you see. And yeah. uh, really, you're trying to make a great painting or you're trying to convey a great feeling. And right. so, for instance, if, if you, know, you know, one of the things that I think that that is a danger of photographs is that, you know, you take a photograph, you, you, you walk out in front of this mountain and you take a photograph and you look at your photograph and the mountain looks so small. Right. And, and in, in a painting, you can exaggerate that mountain so that you really get the sense of the, the ominous size or the sense of scale, or you can move trees around or you can move different Absolutely. pieces around. You're, you're, you're encouraging people to do that, I assume. Absolutely. I mean, uh, that to me is what this is all about for me. You know, yeah. uh, I have no qualms about uh, uh, someone making a photographic realistic painting. None at all. I, I mean, I take my hat off to the craft and to the time consuming effort. But it takes me just as long uh, to do a painting that's not a photorealistic painting 
because it needs to be uh, because I because I keep going back into the painting. I'm saying I've overemphasized this. I've not made this important enough. I, I need to reduce the importance of this particular thing in the painting. I mean, that's why I was saying that painting for the uh, for the gold medal show at the Autry coming up in a couple of, in a month or so. Uh, I've been working on it for six months and, and I'm still not happy and I'm ha getting happier, but I'm still not there. And it's very, uh, it's time consuming, frustrating, but that's part of the, that's part of what it, uh, what it's all about. Well, the people listening didn't actually hear that because that's something we talked about before we started the recording. But, but I, I think that that's an important thing for you to talk to people about because, um, you, you know, you're at this station in life where um, we look at your paintings, which are masterful, some of the the finest landscape paintings that are, are being done today, and we assume that it's easy for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I wish, and if people think it's easy, uh, uh, and, you know, that's just so far away from reality. One of the reasons I can't stand quick draw competitions, which I used to participate in, because uh, you didn't have real time to think about what you were going to do. And uh, and I know I'm getting off on a different tangent here, but, uh, but, but quick draw competitions was something that I just dreaded. But I did it for the early galleries, for the galleries I was in years ago, because they ended up deciding... Uh, they needed to have uh, an event, you know, where you where you were out in a group and and Vic Resaws in one part of the park and uh, some of the other artists who were represented in the gallery were another. And 45 minutes later, I was supposed to come up with a 16 by 20. For me, it is uh, it that was just the last thing that I wanted to promote. First of all, to have my collectors who are gathered behind every artist and behind me as well to say, oh, God, this guy can do a, a, a 16 by 20. I'd love to have for a, in 45 minutes. Well, I had to practice that in, the, in, in, in my studio for day after day over and over again until I thought I might be able to pull it off in 45 minutes. But no, that's not how it is for me. I take my little sketches and I make uh, an enlargement. I start off and block it in. But the frustration of, of ended up ending up with something that ends up giving you the same feeling that I had when I was sitting out in nature, painting on my little six by eight or five by seven board is what's so difficult. I mean, for me, I know I know where I want to go, but getting there is so difficult and so frustrating at times. And that's why this painting for the gold medal show uh, it's just uh, it, I take it and put it on the, my studio so tiny I can't hang it on the wall there, so I end up pay, putting it in a frame, hanging it on the wall in the house, and I walk by it day after day and thinking, yes, I need to work on this area now. I need to change this. Then I take it out of the frame, take it back to the studio, and start working on those areas. It's like this day in and day out. <laughs> Well, I am so happy to hear that. I, um, <laughs> I, I really am because um, I, I think it makes us all feel a little bit better that, that uh, you know, somebody like you is going through that, that kind of a process. And, and I, you know, I, I learned something years ago. And it was somebody in the radio broadcasting industry, which is where I spent a lot of my time. And it was a fellow by the name of Chuck Blore who lives out in Los Angeles. And he used to do radio commercials. And he said, you know, you, you write your commercials and then you sit on them as long as you possibly can, weeks, days, months, if you possibly can, because you need time to think about them. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I think that's really critical for paintings as well, is that, you know, with, I, w I was rushing to get into a show the other day for Valentine's Day, and I, I you know, I was not happy with the painting and I stayed up all night and I worked on it and then I put it down and I, you know, I just didn't have the time. I finally came out with something I was very happy with, but it was a real struggle. And I think that, you know, I, I do my best work. This isn't about me, but I do my best work when I have that chance to put a painting up and, and just kind of look at it and let it haunt me for a while. And then one day it, it, it'll come around. There's a fellow by the name of Fred Picker, who studied with Ansel Adams. You know Ansel, pro probably met him, uh, yeah. knowing the photography background that you had. Yeah. Um, 
Fred Picker studied with Ansel, and he would take his photographs and um, he would soup them, and he wouldn't print them for a year because he was. He said, "I'm too influenced by the emotion at the moment," and he would yeah. print them a year later, and then they would totally look different to him. So, I actually because of that, I started taking paintings and putting them away for a year, or for six months anyway, so that I was not so emotionally engaged in them, and then I'd bring them back out. And I would see them differently because I hadn't been walking by them every day and studying them. Yeah. No, that's absolutely the way I need to do it. I don't know. And, you know, that's one of the things that uh, uh, fellow artists and stuff could discuss uh, their feelings about this. And I think that's the nice thing about the California Art Club, this camaraderie that you have with fellow artists. And you can talk about things that you've kind of been holding inside of you for a long time, like me putting my paintings away and then putting them back in the studio and doing that over and over and over again. Now, the problem is there's a deadline coming up and I do need to do it. Uh, I need to kind of have a resolution here and finish the darn thing. <laughs> but uh, but it's still, that's how I work. I mean, I get them back from galleries and I've been thinking about the painting since it's been there. It didn't sell. And that's not really the issue. I'm not changing it to make it a saleable item. I'm changing it because I need to make changing to the paintings to make me happier. That I'll eventually be very happy with a painting is something that rarely happens, if so ever. What what about the saleable item? Is uh, Do you ever succumb to gallery pressure when they say, hey, you know, we really love those eucalyptus trees. Can you do more of those? Yeah, no, it's true. I do. Uh, I mean, the color, I have a great, uh, I've got what I think is a, a really nice painting of uh, the Grand Canyon, but uh, the gallery in Carmel, uh, Carmel Fine Art, eh, Carl, that's, they'll take it, you know, but they'll give it back to me in three months from now. And so I've kind of uh, come around that uh, the galleries on the California coast want something that is California coast-like. And so I paint and since I love to paint uh, Point Lobos and stuff, I paint a lot of Point Lobos things. I mean, and uh, it, just because I paint it all the time doesn't mean it gets easier for me. It's still a, a struggle, just like the painting that uh, is going to go into the gold medal exhibit here at the Autry. I, I'm struggling with it, even though I've painted that shoreline and those trees and the rocks and stuff many times in the past. So for me, it really, uh, I'm painting what I love, and I'm painting what they feel they could sell, and yet the struggle is the same. I mean, the struggle is absolutely the same. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I have succumbed to the galleries, uh, painting something that the galleries want to sell, uh, but I'm painting what I like to paint, so I'm, I'm perfectly happy. Yeah, well, if you, were, if you were being asked to paint something you didn't want to paint, it probably wouldn't happen, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. I don't do uh, Los Angeles street scenes. Uh, I mean, I just don't. It's not something that um, it's not something that I'm interested in. And, and uh, uh, but uh, Scott Pryor does it pretty well. And so does uh, old, uh, so do a number of other people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you mentioned the camaraderie. Those of us who don't live out there uh wish we did sometimes because of, because of all the events that are going on at the California Art Club. And, right. and of course, um, in New York, it's a Sal McGundy Club, you know, the same kind of thing. And yes. you have the ability to sit around with other artists. That's why, quite frankly, the plein air convention is so appealing to me because, right. um, I, you know, I have a few artists that I get to hang out with here in Austin from time to time, but quite frankly, I'm running a business. And, and so not as much time as I'd like. And yes. to, to be able to sit up at night for a week and hang out in the bars and talk about art at lunch and dinner and breakfast and, and uh, to run across all these different artists and to meet them, I, I think is a, is a wonderful thing. So, I, and, and we do need that sense of community. So that's pretty cool. Well, I'd, I'd like to ask you a couple final questions. So okay. um, in terms of people that you have met who have taught you really important essential lesson, lessons about painting. Is there anybody from the past um, or present that you picked up something that you thought was really important that you learned and maybe something that others should learn? Well, um, you know, 
Yeah, that's a good question. Boy, I wish I'd had that question. <laughs> well, I never give them out in advance because I like to surprise people. <laughs> that would have been nice. That would have been great. That would have been great. But, um, oh, let's see. Um, uh, anyway, I I think Tim Soliday, uh Tim Soliday is a good friend and a great artist and stuff. And I've gone to his ga- his studio, and and instead of him telling me how uh, uh, something that that I observed him uh, doing some of the sketches for the uh, uh, for the uh, cowboy artist uh, in Oklahoma that I think he's become a member of, he I, I he showed he showed me something that I that I didn't do, which is the exactness of his sketches uh, and his enlargements were so detailed compared to from what I do. You know, I have a little uh, thumbnail on my sketchbook and then I make an enlargement by putting a thumbnail on it on a large canvas and then I start blocking in. The amount of work that Tim does to be able to create his paintings was overwhelming. For me, it's like, here's the small sketch, now go to the big one, and I start blocking in. And then, of course, I struggle with it for the next six months. And I'm wondering whether or not I should try his method of being much more detailed in my designing it, and in my, and it's something that I haven't done in the past, but I've thought about it ever since I've seen his method of working. Well, that's an interesting observation. Well, he, you know, he's a master at design. Um, yes, he is. And what a wonderful studio he has. He's, his oh, studio oh. is, is oh. in the top of an old 1940s church in downtown Pasadena. And he's got these right. really big, incredible arch windows. It's a giant space. It's very, yeah. very beautiful yeah, it's, space. It's, it's, Except it's you have wonderful. to climb about 300 flights of stairs to get to it. Yeah, and and you know that there's also Peter's method of of uh, the Lukitz way of pre-mixing your paints and stuff and having them in front of you. I've always thought that was fascinating, and I tried that for a while too. But uh, uh, but um, your refrigerator, you've got to have a freezer where your paints go. Uh, to be able to store them between your painting efforts, and you've got to have those little, uh, those little tiny plastic cups that you can uh, shut and stuff. And I tried that for a while too, and that didn't stick with me either. He, the Lukitz method of pre-mixing all of your colors and having them all in front of you, in an array, uh, that was fascinating to me as well. But it didn't. Uh, I tried it, but it didn't uh, stick with me as well. Well, we have to try things, and and. Um... Yeah. You, you know, you have to find out what works for you. So um, a final question. Yes. Um, you are gathered around your friends and family mm-hmm. to celebrate your last day on earth. <laughs> and um, everything that you've done in your life, all the paintings that you've created have disappeared from all the walls. Right. You have three pieces of advice that you can give people. That could be advice about life. That can be advice about painting. It doesn't matter. Um, just three things that you think are essential that everybody grasps and understands. What would those three things be? Well, number one would be uh, uh, pick a job that's not a job. Pick a job that's something you love to do. I mean that's that's it. If you love to do it, it's not a job. It becomes uh, it makes your life so much easier. Uh, and and the second thing is um, stay close to the family, and uh, and love your family. And number three would be, uh, I hope you get to enjoy your life as much as I have. I mean I've been the luckiest guy in the world. I really have. Every time I think about having my parents at age forty pick up their stuff and come to America with three kids uh, and start from scratch, it, it, it was wonderful. I mean, the family has been the most important thing and and that my dad actually had the intestinal fortitude to pick up the family and move to another country, another language for the kids. It's been a fantastic boon to us and I feel like I've been the luckiest man in the world and hopefully the people that are listening at my bedside in the last moments will take that to heart, you know? Do what you love. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. 
Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Plein Air Convention in April. It's not far. Um, yeah. And I hope that you you bring some paintings to throw in the show uh, because okay. I, I, I think we'd like to snatch those up. Um, that's definitely on my wish list. You, yours and Tim's and Peter's and... Well, there's so many paintings and so little money. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> well, I'll yeah. be looking forward to seeing you too. Yes. Well, thank you so much. This was very insightful, and, and we really appreciate your time today. Eric, thank you, and we'll see you in April. Thanks again to Carl Dempwolf, uh, an amazing painter. I wish I owned about 30 of his pieces. Even one would be nice, actually. Sponsored by the Plen Air Convention held this April in San Diego with some of the most amazing artists in the world as faculty to teach you. Whether you're a beginner, just learning to paint, or an experienced pro, it's an amazing event. There's People actually say it's life-changing. There's so much going on. It's pretty cool. We go outdoors to paint every day. We will break the world's record for the most painters painting outdoors together simultaneously. Uh, I think we've broken that each of the last five years in a row. We're going to break it again this six year, this year, the sixth one, because it's bigger than ever. We have four stages of big screens, instructions. You can see every detail. Uh, we will have, I think when all is said and done, a faculty of about 80 people, including people, faculty members who are out there working with you in the field so that you can get to be a better painter. The interview is also sponsored by the Plen Air Salon Art Competition. You can win $15,000 cash and the cover of Plen Air Magazine, but you've got to get your entry in right away. We're down to the wire. Well, this has been fun. I always love doing this podcast. The Plen Air movement continues to be red hot, which is why Plen Air Magazine is the number one selling representational art magazine at Barnes & Noble nationwide. So drop by, pick one up, or you can get a bi-monthly subscription for half the price of the newsstand by going to plenairmagazine.com. Well, thanks again for your time. Thank you to Carl, and I will see you at the Plen Air Convention. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. Remember, it's a great, big, beautiful world out there. Go paint it. Bye-bye. 